Oh gosh, thank you so much, Jody, for that introduction and the warm welcome here in Kansas. I think as she was um, mentioning, it's a Saturday. You guys are all here and it's beautiful outside, so I really appreciate it. Um, I'm here for less than 48 hours, but in the time that I've been here, the hospitality has been amazing. I've had a chance to meet with some of the graduate students and take a look at the studio facilities, and I can't wait to do more, actually, after this talk. So, um, uh, and as, uh, as some background, as she mentioned, um, I work mostly in sculpture and installation, and I come from a serious uh, kind of traditional materials-based practice, and I think that's also gone on to influence how I translate that into things that are more ephemeral, and maybe um, even forays into the digital or virtual worlds. Um, I titled the talk today, Frictions, Flows, and Fabrications on Restless Objects and Diverted Production Channels. And that's to kind of emphasize the idea of um, objects moving through systems. So um, to go back again, though, to this real materiality of things, I'm interested in the word fabricate. And this is just something I pulled off of uh, dictionary.com. The, the term, the word has uh, three definitions that are attached to it. The first, which seems to be pretty straightforward, which is to make build or construct, and that's something that we're really familiar with. The second is to devise, invent, or concoct, as in a story or a lie. And I think that's where things start to get really interesting because it goes into more narrative territory. And then the last, which is to fake or forge. So within this one simple word are three different ways of being able to kind of look at it. And I... After getting out of school, um, you know, with this traditional sculpture background, I got a job working at the Exploratory Museum in San Francisco, which is a science museum. And part of my job there was to work with scientists, educators, and artists and translate really complicated ideas into uh, museum uh, exhibits that sort of rendered these ideas um, uh, in a more simple or straightforward kind of way. And that's a great job to have. It was, you know, uh, as getting out with an art degree, one wonders what one can do with that afterwards. And so jumping straight into a kind of design field was interesting. It also helped me kind of navigate how to create uh, works that dealt specifically with the public, but through, you know, a world of design. Um, working full time also had its problems because trying to find a time to make uh, my own studio work got really difficult, and one way in which I solved it was to try to start making artwork while on the job. So this is from a project um, obviously dated because of the technology here, but it's called After Hours Office Interventions, and I would sneak into my coworkers' offices after they'd gone home at night and leave behind what looked like these red floppy diskettes. And on closer inspection, though, they were actually made out of foam core and contact paper. So I was hand fabricating what appeared to be these sort of high-tech objects, inserting um, over the period of about two months, about 50 of them, into my colleagues' workspaces, documenting them with this, um, this sort of snapshot photography, and then going home. So then the next day I would come into work, and it was fascinating because nobody would mention anything about them. It's as if these objects kind of slipped into the, um, the everyday of the workspace. And for me, this was fascinating because I was also starting to get really um, kind of... Uh, um, uninterested in the traditional gallery setting. Because once you create an object and you put it in this sort of special place of, you know, the white cube, it sort of sits there and it becomes this mute thing that's removed from forms of social interaction or value systems outside of um, the art world. So with this type of work, it was, it was interesting because then I was thinking, well, who is the audience? Like, if you don't even know that the artwork is there, is, does it have an audience? And uh, a, a period of years after this, I presented the work to a class at the San Francisco Art Institute and someone raised his hand and said, oh my God, I found one of them. And I said, wow, well, you know, tell me the story, what happened? And he said, well, I was interning at the museum trying to figure out a way to transfer files from one outdated computer to another, opened a drawer, picked one up, and was completely confused. And I said, okay, well, what did you do with it afterwards? And he said, well, I put it back. So there's this interesting idea, too, that these things are almost acting as undercover agents, you know, sort of like looking like they belong enough so that they, they stay in the space, and yet every now and then kind of creating this little rupture or interruption in business as usual. So from that project, and this was very early on, from about 1999, I started thinking a little bit more about circulations of things. I'm, and I'm going to skip along also to... Um, uh, 2006. So uh, 
After graduate school, I started a project called the Counterfeit Crochet Project, Critique of a Political Economy. And this is from the website in which I was um, inviting crochet crafters from all over the world to join me in debasing and defiling designer items one step at a time by hand making them out of crochet. So from the website, it uh, solicited people to download images of designer handbags that they wished that they owned but couldn't afford, and then using their own crochet crafting skills to approximate a, um, a simulation of it. So this is one that I just did by myself just to kind of get the ball rolling. And then after putting it up online, I was promptly amazed by the flooding of people from around the world that wanted to participate in this project. So these are working, collaboration, working collaboratively with non-artists. Um, this is uh, Carrie in Ohio with her Dior bucket bag. And I was also encouraging people to take photographs of themselves modeling the objects and then black out their eyes because essentially what they're doing is um, uh, illegal. Uh, this is Diana in Portland with her Dior handbag. And there are no patterns for these uh, bags. In other words, the, the crafters are just using their own skill sets to produce these objects. And in a way, I was thinking of these things as um, like low-resolution JPEG versions of the real thing. Because it, you know, if you think about that, they're working off of um, images downloaded online, and then by translating them with this, you know, very kind of clunky, uh, crafted uh, material of crochet, you get this really strange object. And they're at once these unique uh, kind of expressions as well that are. It's not possible to mass produce these things. Uh, this is Nicole in Mississippi with her Dolce and Gabbana. Uh, this is Katie in London with her Louis Vuitton Murakami. And Katie went to the Louis Vuitton store to model her bag. <laughs> uh, Wendy in Michigan with her fundy purse. And again, the, the, the fabrication of these objects also mirrored the, uh, the skill levels of the crafters. So this is a, a very odd approximation of one. Uh, this is Carrie's attempt at a coach bag. So the image on the left is what she was working off of, and then the image on the right is the approximation. And, you know, there's something really beautiful about this slippage, right? You know, the, the thing on the left is this idealized version. The thing on the right is the more kind of accessed version. And Carrie and I had some interesting conversations where she was really upset that she couldn't become, that she couldn't be a better fabricator of this thing. And I was telling her that, you know, the, the thing on the right I value so much more because it actually has that kind of human quality of an attempt to become an idealized form. And so it's not quite a failure, it's actually more a reflection of either issues, you know, reality issues of class or access or um, economy. And so the project ex has expanded in the sense that um, I was starting to lead counterfeiting workshops in different um, uh, context. So this is in at Garanti Gallery in Istanbul, and the counterfeiting workshops essentially just consisted of me sitting at a table with a whole lot of yarn, and people would come in, and I would engage them in conversations about issues of black market economies, uh, craft traditions, and um, a, a sort of like a um, revamped knitting circle. Um, and it, it's in different countries. It also was interesting because it would invariably different stories would come up about. Um, you know, everyone's relationship to craft tradition. And they've also grown into installations. So this is at the Yerba Buena Center for the Arts where images of the makers are shown on the wall, invitations are there for people to actually participate on site, and then bags that are on loan from the makers are displayed as well. So the collection consists of um, the works donated by the makers from um, around the world. There's also downloadable um, PDFs, so you can get tips on how to get the Gucci look, um, make it Chanel baby, and then the logo cheat sheet to reference some ways of producing things. So everything was fine and dandy until about 2009 when I got a cease and desist letter from Louis Vuitton, which I thought was really interesting because obviously the, the logic structure of this project was very, very different from a traditional counterfeiting ring. It's a three-page letter in which they outline point by point how this project actually is a, um, what is it? it, it's, it trivializes the issue of counterfeiting and that counterfeiting is a crime. And along with that was this wonderful article they sent me um, from Harper's Bazaar in which they also equated my project to the larger problem of child labor, terrorism, and human trafficking. So the, what was fascinating about this was that um, you know, the, the actual logic structure of the project 
is very, very different from the traditional manufacturing structure. And I created this production flow schematic just to kind of make it more evident for myself. And so on the left-hand side is the flow in how I see it, which is this, there may be a central hub in which the project exists, but then the, the fabrication and the R&D happens in sort of these satellite areas with conversation being mixed in versus on the right-hand side where you have this hierarchical kind of like top-down model of how a fashion house traditionally works with consumption and production, um, you know, all tied in there. So. Um, in the end, I wound up actually not uh, responding at all to the letters, and they they did fade. But it was it was this odd moment in which you know something a project for me which started off as a kind of tongue in cheek critique actually had legs to you know sort of um, uh, at least raise attention to the corporation, which I thought was really funny. Um, so moving along, um, the so in two thousand nine, I was invited to participate in. Uh, the Freeze Art Fair as a commissioned project. So the Freeze Fair is obviously, a, it's a very large uh, commercial art fair where blue chip galleries from all over the world converge and then sell very expensive art commodities to the public. Freeze Projects is a kind of branch of that in which they commission artists to do works that may or may not have anything to do with the commercial sector. My proposal, however, was called Copy Stand, an autonomous manufacturing zone. And this is the concept sketch in which I proposed that um, I would have my own gallery booth in the fair. On the left-hand side, I would set up a live production space in which I would hire five young artists to bootleg other artworks found in the other gallery booths. And then as soon as they were finished, we would push them into our right-hand side gallery and sell them to the public at drastically discounted prices. So they took that idea, which I thought was kind of amazing. And so over the period of five days, Copy Stand ran live in the space. And so visitors to the fair could actually watch my artists busily producing. And over the period of the fair, too, it was a, it was a finite business model. I sent my artists out to um, essentially, uh, well, so this is a, what is this, a Philip Gustin? Uh, painting and the original was about two hundred and fifty thousand dollars down the way. Ours was sold for two hundred and fifty pounds, and was built at exactly the the same dimensions as the original. So the the challenge for my artists was that they um, uh, they had to work very quickly. They didn't know what was going to be shown at the other booths, and so as they were um, as the crates uh, were being unloaded for the other booths, I sent out my artists with digital cameras to shoot images of them, and then we would produce them almost immediately and, and try to stock the gallery. So it was a very fast turnaround time. This is our, um, the, our office area of research and production, showing some of the works that we were going to be um, reproducing. And then this is a shot of our gallery on the very first day, stocked with works. So. Um, it was a really fascinating thing because, you know, the uh, on initial inspection, the works it, they were hard to distinguish from the real works. Um, it's hard to tell it sometimes if an artwork is trash or if an artwork is a real artwork. <laughs> Context is everything. Uh, nothing was over 500 pounds, though, so that translates to about maybe 750 US dollars. So compare this to the high-end art objects being sold in the other booths. We were the bargain bin. And for most of the fairgoers, too, who didn't have access to that type of capital to purchase, we became the site in which people congregated to talk about issues of access and um, access, class, and value. So over the period of five days, 35,000 people visited the fair. It was, a, it was a real crush of production and selling and um, conversation. This is a, a shot of one of our artists, David Shrigley, remakes in progress. And so the printout is what you see, the, the small image kind of off the far end of the table, and then the David Shrigley remake that we had there. And as my artist was working on it, four very well-dressed uh, women came by and started nervously talking to themselves about it in front of him. And he looked up and he said, oh, could you believe they're selling this drawing down the way for 20,000 pounds? And they turned to him and they said, yes, we know. We are his Vienna gallery. <laughs> and you know, as soon as the gallerists started to understand what was happening, they would come to see what our quality was like. Um, so as it unfolded, too, 
um, the, the, the galleries could do nothing about it because we were sanctioned by the fair. A couple of the artists came by, the, the artists we were bootlegging, to also check out our quality. And there were, there were times when um, they were, it was very, very close. And so this is shots of uh, uh, artworks being sold, different um, things happening. On the top left is one of the artists that we knocked off uh, quite rapidly, actually, Ajit Chauhan. And he was so game that we gave him a little gift in, thank in thanks. And um, so as part of the logic structure, too, you know, if you think about the business model, we started the business at the beginning of the fair. We also had to shut it down. And so on the very last day, I made these signs that occupied the space um, advertising drastic cuts because we did need to liquidate. And if you could imagine this installation taking place directly right next door to a high-end gallery booth, which is desperately trying to maintain its value system of why it needs to sell these high-end art objects, this project also happened in 2009, the year right after the economic crash, in which the people who were putting on the fair were very concerned if the prices were going to hold. The year before, the art market experienced a horrible crash, and um, the 2008 freeze fair did not do very well at all. And so this as a commentary to you know, potentially another um, step in the process of devaluation was a large part of it. Um, so in the end, we wound up selling uh, everything. This is our image of the, the gallery booth on the very last day. So everything was liquidated. I also, to, I also created an alternative economic structure for the project. So all my artists were paid a daily stipend to produce. They also uh, decided what they wanted to counterfeit. And then they also set their own prices and then kept 100% of the sales profits from it. So, or I'm sorry, not the sales profits, but this, the entire sale uh, was theirs to keep. So in the end, you know, that was a, a very different situation from how traditional gallery or retail models are set up in which 50% goes to the store and 50% to the artist. So within this weird sort of um, uh, alternative economic system, I tried to give the artists as much leeway as possible to make the choices on how they were being whether you want to call it exploited or utilized or involved as collaborators, who knows? Um, but that th this project was, uh, I, I thought, successful in many ways because it blurred the boundaries between who was in charge, who who the author was in the end, and also who our audience was. Uh, so directly on the heels of that project, I was invited to do um, uh, something at PS1, and. Uh, MoMA and PS1 were collaborating on a project called 1969, in which 30 years afterwards, in the year 2009, they were looking at seminal artworks dated from 1969 to see how the political implications of those artworks carried forward 30 years later. One of the problems, though, is that MoMA would not lend PS1 some of the key objects because of either fragility or insurance values. And so I was called in to um, essentially create proxies of some of the more well-known uh, pieces. I chose two pieces to kind of redo, and um, but with a completely different logic structure. So whenever I stage my projects, I also like to have them respond very contextually to what, what the predicament is. And in this particular case, um, the two works that I really resonated with me, um, these are my recreations of them. In the front, it's temporal aggregate social configuration, or borrowed voice. And in the back is custom transitional utility object, or Morris mover. And so on first glance as a visitor, they appear very similar to the originals, except the logic structure is very different. For the Joseph Boyce piece, I decided that instead of buying all the components for his iconic sled uh, piece, that I would reach out to my, um, my extended family of artists, uh, the network of artists that I knew, to see if they could loan me any of the components of this Boyce work. So it's essentially just a wooden sled wool blanket, leather strapping, vintage flashlight, and hunk of lard. And then from there had each um, person who volunteered deliver the objects to PS1, in which I assembled then a collection of them. And then from there chose what I considered the kind of um, the, the best stand-in of them. So the way this piece worked is that it was ephemeral in the sense that it consisted entirely of borrowed objects and you know trying to also resuscitate Boyce's ideals of uh, a kind of collective social system. And the lovely thing about it was that 
um, on the gallery wall hung up next to other wall labels of say, you know, Robert Smithson works or Richard Serra works, the wall label for me listed my lenders as all 25 artists who lended to it. And that was in uh, contradiction to say the uh, adjacent wall level that would list someone as say Rockefeller or any of the high-end donors. So it was this attempt to kind of create a, a more, um, like a, a, a closer affinity uh, to who gets to be a lender, who gets access to produce these works. Um, the Robert Morris piece, uh, so this is a shot of the original large-scale wall felt hangings that he uh, was well known for doing. And so Morris used to uh, use materials found from industrial processes. The original felt piece is very heavy, and um, it hangs, and it, it sort of bears the weight of the kind of factory production that went into the materials. Um, I became fascinated in the idea that, you know, the, one of the main differences between 1969 and 2009 was a lot of the factories have since shut down. A lot of the production happens overseas. Um, there's a lot less kind of connection to the type of manufacturing that has happened, um, that used to happen within the U.S. So in order to kind of uh, bring forward those ideas of labor and industry, I had a, um, an American moving blanket factory produce a moving blanket in the exact same shape as the Morris. And then we used that, uh, I collaborated with the preparator staff at PS1 to use it to actually wrap um, original artworks traveling from MoMA to PS1. So the Morris Blanket traveled this, the kind of backhand channels um, handled by the preparators and treated as if it was um, just a regular moving blanket. So here it is on the left-hand side being wrapped around a large steel Richard Serra piece as it's being uncrated. On the right hand, it's wrapped around a Robert Irwin piece. And I wanted it to kind of um, go through the fictional um, transit that the original Morris could not go through. Um, and then I also wanted the crew to treat it as if it was any you know, standard blanket. And some of the creative ways in which they were using it to wrap was really interesting too, because obviously it's an odd shape. So at first it was a hindrance, and then they started figuring out really uh, clever ways to, to make it work. Um, that ways in which a, a regular rectangular blanket uh, couldn't have been used. And then from there, we hung it in the galleries um, in the same kind of configuration as the original Morris, but then kept all the marks of the labor attached to it. And then the way that the American moving blanket, uh, they, they automatically put in this uh, little flag, which I thought was kind of a nice apt uh, stamp. And then it was also shown with some of the images from the... Um, from the, uh, the moving of it. But what I liked about this piece was so, you know, this was in the midst of about 50 other iconic real artworks from 1969. Vito Acconci, uh, Richard Serra, Robert Smithson. And so people would show up to the exhibition knowing that I was in the show and then they would walk around and, and, and afterwards tell me, I couldn't find your work. You know, and I would say, well, did you look close enough? You know, and, they, and obviously they hadn't. And so what I liked about this piece, too, is that I didn't really want to, to, um, to uh, take over the original. They slipped in such a way also that maybe people actually felt they were getting, you know, a similar experience. Um, obviously it wasn't, but then um, the, the senior curatorial staff from MoMA took Richard Serra himself around because he had a huge room installed right next door and they walked into my gallery space and um, he said, Richard Serra said, oh, this is so great, you got the Morris. <laughs> and, and they said, well, no, not really. And they told him the story and he looked really kind of confused and he was like, oh, oh, okay. And then he said, oh, but you got the boys. And I said, no, not really. And then they told him again the story. And then he turned to the real Smithson in the cor corner and he asked, is that a real Smithson? <laughs> so, you know, this weird fuzzy territory in which the, you know, one of the prime artists from that generation was even having this kind of odd relationship to the then and the now of how these things were produced. Um, so I'm also really interested, uh, uh, along with working with physical things and things that go through space, um, literally, I'm interested in how that also translates in the virtual world. So um, Google SketchUp was produced, was invented by Google. Um, unfortunately, they sold it, so now it belongs to a private company. But for a while, it was a 3D free modeling software that anyone around the world could download and use. And it was a, a wonderful alternative to a, a complicated uh, program like CAD or Rhino or Maya, except that um, one of the, the 
cool things about it too was that it had this shared database. So along with being able to produce objects virtually, you could upload them and share them with other people. So other folks could also download them and, and work with it. So in, it was a really um, kind of collaborative and almost open source type of uh, space. And as you can see, there's these really great kind of subcategories that people were creating. And this is all self-organized. So it's whatever people were deciding to make. Everything from historic rural structures to moon objects to plants or you know, furniture things. I became really fascinated with a whole category of things that were that nobody knew what they were, but they were uploading them. So this is a, a, an object called random, and it is just described as being random. Uh, this is the thing number one, and it says a yellow thing. You know, and so when people are producing these things, um, you know, it, I was just so curious about, well, why, why do you want to share them? You know, like what, what is it about these non-object objects that you can't even define? Um, so from there, I collected as many of these things as possible, these self-categorized non-object objects. Um, so this is a nice selection of what they look like in my own SketchUp file. And as you can see, it's, it's quite an array of things. Um, and then took meticulous uh, measurements from each one and then uh, wound up hand building them all using um, very common sculptural materials. So this is a project called Particulate Matter, things, thingies, thingies. And uh, what they are are, you know, essentially things that should never have been built. Uh, you know, when you think about the value system of these random things, like why would anyone put any form of importance on them or choose to hand build them? And as mentioned before, I, I do projects in which I get other people to enact the labor or the production of things, but I'm also not against doing it myself. So this is me acting as a very cheap analog 3D printer. And the, so they were displayed about 72 of these thingies, um, hand-built out of foam core, contact paper, cardboard, fabric, and paper. They were displayed on these kind of pallet structures that, so, that seemed to kind of promote this idea of flow or you know, production or movement. And then on the wall was a video projection of some of the original digital images that kind of helped cycle them um, into the referencing digital space. And I think the variety of things were really great. So when one walked into the room, it was hard to tell whether these were um, architectural models or science fiction objects or you know, some form of utopian you know, design structure. And I also provided um, uh, a kind of uh, map. So the exhibition checklist uh, showed the object placements and then the attributions that the, the designers themselves had given them. Um, everything looks great, but then you start to kind of scrutinize what people are saying and realize that how completely off the wall and random they are. So, you know, number two, which is cool by Conroy 96, a cool thingy with other thingies floating around it. You know, uh, number 20, a simple weird thing with a gangster chimney by Anonymous. LOL, I love RICW. You know, I have no clue what to call this. I just made it while I was bored. So the funny thing, though, was building, you know, number six especially, random by Computer Guy 505 what I got after clicking randomly, that object was really hard to build. And so this also this, this difference between, you know, what one can build online versus the reality of the thing as it exists in space, um, that was a, a challenge that I wanted to put myself through the, the motions of. And at the end of um, the exhibition, I decided that uh, people could come to the show and take what they wanted from it and disperse the objects back out into the world. Because in a way, I was wondering about, you know, do I own these objects or am I just the fabricator of them? And there's a rich tradition also of artist fabricators, you know, who work and make work or make other people's works. Maybe that's how this, this was, and maybe I don't own the thing. So after accumulating them from the kind of virtual space of the internet, they had to like then go back out into the real world sort of as a parallel kind of um, trajectory. Um, so, sh and so moving along to 2010, I was commissioned to do a project at SFMOMA, and um, they specifically wanted something that dealt with the public in some way, and that you know, created a kind of interactive engagement of some sort. I proposed a, a shadow shop 
a, 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 what appears to be a gift store, but essentially has a very different type of logic structure attached to it. This is the website that I designed for it. Most of my projects also have multiple components where there's an installation component, some form of an online um, information dissemination uh, component as well. And so it's described as a temporary and alternative store embedded within the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art's fifth floor galleries, which would stock hundreds of artists, multiple small works, tchotchke, catalogs, books, zines, media works, and other distributive creative output. While operating as an actual mom and pop style store, Shadow Shop is a platform for exploring the ways in which artists are navigating the production, consumption, and dissemination of their work. Four themes, artwork as commodity, cultural souvenirs, bootlegs and counterfeits, and alternative distribution systems will be displayed. So this went on for about six months. The actual site itself looks like a gift shop, so you dump out from a, ma a major exhibition on the third floor galleries into the expected thing, the gift shop. Um, but then as you start to kind of pick through it, you realize that um, things might not be as they seem. So some of the things for offer on there are um, things that question uh, capitalism itself or um, kind of are s selling remainders or discards of the artistic process. Um, this is a set of other people's memories. And so this is a, sh a Shadow Shop branded thing, which is, consists of five unique C prints of, of found photographs that are then repackaged as new to you and then sold for $2.99. A packet. Um, we wound up selling about five hundred and fifty dollars worth of other people's memories to the public. Um, there's also San Francisco fog for a dollar ninety nine. Ethnic flavor for a, another dollar ninety nine. Augmentative flavor packets. Um, other artists. So I I commissioned. I worked with two hundred other Bay Area artists. So this was a collaborative. Uh, Collaborative effort. This is Iman Ye's You Can Also Be a Painter of Light, which is a, a paint by number print for $20, in which that is Thomas Kincaid's uh, mugshot for when he was arrested for drunk driving. Um, this is Gordon Winyemko's Art Rocks. So for $20 a set, you bought a box that had two rocks in it and a map which showed you how to drive from the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art to the California State Capitol, where then you throw the rocks at the State Capitol to protest cuts in arts funding. So this, is a, this became a platform where I was specifically asking artists to respond to the conditions of their commodification. Um, this is the artist Chris Bell's Cheap Money. And so for 99 cents, you could buy a dollar. And his logic, so it was a limited edition. Uh, there were only 500 of them available. And so we had to kind of parse them out through the run of the exhibition because they were ridiculously popular. And what his logic structure behind this was that, um, so off, off every sale he makes, he lost money. And he said, you know, as an artist, that happens to me all the time. Why don't I just make a work about it? And so, you know, this was his explicit response to that predicament. Um, I also created, I, I tried to push the logic as far as possible with having these events and sales. And I worked with um, a, a performative group called Wonderment Consortium where we set up the shadow shopping channel, which was kind of like a live QVC style streaming event. Um, and we would hawk the artist wares, have interviews with them, and then kind of like amplify the excitement for the sale. And then similar to the, um, the, the uh, copy stand uh, project, I decided too that, you know, the, the project was only supposed to go on for six months. It had a very specific duration, actually five months, but why not work with that logic structure? And, you know, it is the worst business model ever. Um, we, we had a total liquidation sale. The reason it was a really bad business model was also similar to copy stand. We gave 100% of the sales back to the artists. So the museum invested $35,000 into this project and they made nothing back. But that's also completely in line with the way the logic structure of most museums work. You commission an artist to do a project and it's not exactly like you get a return on it. Um, we had a lot of visitors. We had over 200 artists included in the project. And at the very end of it, in five months, uh, over 10,000 items were sold to the public, over $105,000 in sales. So essentially what I did was I tripled the museum's investment to 
put those funds directly back into the artist community. I also hired eight people at above living wage, and that's important to me. My projects don't involve volunteer work. Everything is paid. I also commissioned three new artist projects. And um, you know, again, this idea of the leveraging, the leveraging of the funds and the resources and attempting to kind of bring more voices back into the, um, the arena of who gets to be in charge of being in the art world. Um, it was a really successful project. It was also really, really grueling. And so I've had um, requests to repeat it at different uh, times and places, but there's, I, I don't really see a point in it. It's a very specific project for that area. Um, how are we doing on time? I think I'll... Woohoo! All right, off. Yeah, okay, here we go. So I'm gonna go through it really quick. Golden Gate Bridge, 75th anniversary, 1937 to 2012. As Jody mentioned, um, I did a project uh, called International Orange Commemorative Store, a proposition in which at the base of the Golden Gate Bridge uh, is uh, uh, Fort Point, which is a kind of open uh, tourist area that people visit. And artists were commissioned to do projects in there. I created a what appeared to be a souvenir shop in which all the, the thousands of objects inside were bathed simply in the color of the bridge. So there was no text, no images, no, um, no recognizable thing except for the color as branding. Um, it encompassed everything. Lots of things from furniture, clothing, tote bag, jewelry, keychains, magnet, souvenir, books, bottled water, DVDs. The DVDs actually played International Orange, so you put it in and all it was was 20 minutes on a loop of just the color. Everything was intense. There was branding, business cards, tote bags. Um, this was a, a book that was produced in which it's a model of a, of a book produced in 1937 during the opening of the bridge in which I substituted all the, the information for just the color and reprinted it. I also worked, everything though was hand produced, so I worked with small scale fabricators locally. Um, this is a collaboration with Heath Ceramics in Sausalito where they produced a, a very specific glaze just for the project. Um, everything was hand assembled, so unlike most uh, overseas manufacturing of cheap uh, souvenir tchotchke, everything was hand produced and uh, paid uh, for the artisans. Oops. The only, the different logic structure of this though was that nothing was for sale. So it existed as a static installation. You walked into the, uh, into the piece and were promptly confused by the fact that you couldn't buy anything. And uh, the logic structure of that was also such that um, the, it was acquired by the San Jose Museum subsequently as a donation because I don't, there's no value, since nothing was for sale, I couldn't figure out what the value was of the, of the work. And so it couldn't be sold as a piece. And thankfully, Jody was part of the, um, the, the steering committee to, to uh, get the piece acquired by the museum. So it is there, thankfully. I'm gonna actually skip along for the sake of time, and I'm just gonna go, s I know. No, 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 well, there's, oh, it's okay. You can see that piece online. I wanna talk more about, this. so this is the piece, there's a version of it here at the, um, at the Ulrich Museum. And originally it was commissioned uh, in 2012 for the 01 Biennial in Silicon Valley in San Jose, California. And it was part of a exhibition about technology and the artist's kind of role in technology. Um, I became very fascinated with the idea of uh, piracy within technology. So most of us are familiar with the idea of um, you know, downloads, whether it's music, media, uh, mostly it's music and media, but there's also a really interesting kind of file sharing culture around texts, which I find really interesting. Um, free texts, an open source reading room, was a physical space that was set up that essentially was an analog file sharing site. And so there's a series of um, bookshelves on one side, a kind of reading table area, a flyer wall, which is very similar to kind of how the, the flyers are displayed here at the Ulrich, and then a production desk. So it was this four part kind of space in which um, it was activated by viewers who came to kind of pick from the selection of texts. And it's a self-reflective piece in the sense that I wanted most of the text to be about issues of the commons and public space and copyright and ownership and economies. And so, you know, by, by downloading these texts, if you tear off a, um, a tab and type in the URL at home, you can download a PDF of the, of the works. And so you're essentially participating in an illegal activity, but it appears to be this very kind of innocuous kind of thing. Um, this is a, a shot of, you know, one of the details 
And I would also man the desk. So as the librarian, I would sit there and give people recommendations for what they wanted to um, maybe access. I would also download uh, texts and uh, print them as the, and bind them and to put them on the shelves so you could, you could read them on site. And the other thing to point out is that I don't, I'm not the person that actually uploads these texts. These are all found, um, already existing, floating around. So what I'm doing is just creating a, a, the kind of physical reflection of a system that's already there. Um, I, I've shown the piece in different places and different um, arenas, from uh, commercial gallery spaces to nonprofits to museums. And it was only recently last year a really kind of, I thought, disturbing thing happened where I was included in an exhibition in Sao Paulo, and about a month before the work was supposed to move forward as a new commission, um, it was canceled due to corporate sponsorship objections by 3M Corporation. So as a sculptor, I didn't realize that 3M didn't make just tape. Uh, 3M is also really invested in issues of intellectual property, and they are now involved in like cloud computing and all forms of kind of digital um, archiving and access. And it was really shocking that in in um, Brazil, of all countries, which is famous for its counterfeiting of uh, uh, pharmaceuticals in order to actually help its population with HIV, AIDS drugs, and other other things, the rich history of cannibalization of culture in Brazil that this was the space in which 3M actually had a, um, a say in its uh, demise. So from there, thankfully, it was really nice. Jody actually reached out and um, wanted to include it at Ulrich, so I was very happy to be a part of it. But um, some of the email correspondence that went on about it. And it has been shown in other places. So it's, it's not like it's, um, it's a very uh, limited form of, uh, uh, of censorship, really. Um, but it changes in different areas. So last year it was in Bangkok at the Bangkok Art and Culture Center and I collaborated with an organization called The Reading Room. And this was happening during, in, exactly during the Bangkok protests. The, these protests were happening right outside the museum. So as I was installing and setting up these texts dealing with issues of access and the closure of information, the Thai government was actually censoring a lot of news announcements about the protests that were happening and things were getting yanked off of Facebook. So it was really interesting to be a part of something that was unfolding as we were creating the project. I also try to, if it's shown internationally, I try to tailor it to um, different texts that respond to the conditions happening there as well. So from that, um, you know, certain Thai uh, texts that uh, are hard to get a hold of um, over there or, you know, political um, texts that also get censored and um, you know things that kind of respond more particularly to Southeast Asia. Um, let's see. Okay, so I'm gonna skip on. Also, sorry guys, time time is of the essence. These are other um, projects that I work online with, tampering with uh, spaces like Facebook to create an alternative um, television show. Um, <laughs> this is a, a project called um, Faux Rwanda, and um, in which I was researching um, YouTube videos, amateur YouTube videos on how to make fake weed. There seems to be a lot of them on there, which is really bizarre. Most of them, are, I guess, are for pranks, and most of them utilize um, common grocery store elements. So I was researching those, um, found a whole selection of, uh, went grocery shopping to buy the, the listed ingredients, and then from there um, held workshops and competitions at different artist residencies in which I was challenging artists to make better facsimiles of fake weed. Um, so uh, these are, it's documentation. There's 36 hours to make a better bud. And then we, we judge it, and then um, we also have the director and staff of the organizations be the final um, award, win, uh, award um, bestowers, or the final judges. Um, <laughs> the, I'm also really interested, this is the last project I'm gonna show, and this is something that actually I'm happy to say that I, this is the project I pitched for the Guggenheim Fellowship and I'm really happy that they've supported it because it's a long-term project that I feel is gonna take a number of years, mostly because of access to what I need to do the project and then also because of technological limitations that I hope are gonna unfold over the years. It's funny how, you know, if you think about five years ago, you know, the price has dropped so much on everything from like hard drive space to cloud computing or whatever, and it's, it's almost hard to predict, you know, what can happen five years from now. 
But I became interested in this idea of ectoplasm, which is this kind of paranormal manifestation in the real world of the, the kind of spirit world. So this crossover, you know, if you think about the spirit world as maybe a metaphor also for the virtual or these things that kind of float around nebulously as data or, you know, and then, and then they kind of come into computers and then they turn into, you know, uh, some form of object or manifestation in some way. Um, 19th century studies of ectoplasm were fascinating because most of them were, were, were complete fabrications. You know, this is like magazine cutouts of, of, uh, of pictures would get put onto, um, you know, muslin that then is supposed to, uh, you know, come out of your mouth to suggest that you're regurgitating this, this spirit world stuff. Um, the, the photos are kind of amazing. Um, but in thinking of, of this sort of conjuring of ghosts. I'm also really interested in the legacy of colonialism and um, an empire and how the, the centuries of history of cultures overlapping and overlaying and kind of forcing themselves onto each other has kind of created this whole sort of spirit ghost world of, uh, of anxiety and, and horror to a certain extent. This is a, you know, a, like a, um, a pretty straightforward map of some of the flows of, of empire and trade routes um, specifically, the, uh, the Belgian Congo is an interesting example because the, from 1885 to 1908, uh, the, the, an area of the Congo was not a colony of Belgium, but it was actually the possession of Leopold II. So he owned, a, he privately owned a whole country and, and pulled from it its resources, finally turning it into a colony eventually. But it's this odd space in which like the, the kind of the, the capitalist foresight of ownership here you know, took a, a really hard uh, turn. Um, the, the Belgian Congo is also the site of inspiration for um, Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness, which then also went on to inform um, uh, uh, Apocalypse Now which, uh, you know, so there's this interesting kind of like legacy of this history. I was commissioned to work on a project with the Flack Workplace for Visual Artists in Genk, Belgium. And what I decided to do is because of the particular history of the Belgian Congo, I wanted to collaborate with um, the, the antiquities museums there. On the left-hand side, you see uh, Art Nouveau Belgian objects that were produced in the early part of the 20th century. And on the right-hand side are Congolese ceramic objects that were produced at exactly the same time. So this is sort of a parallel production happening between the empire and the colony. You can't really see signs of the sort of infection on each other. And I was wondering about that friction between the two. Like, what is hidden in these forms? And how can one form have been produced in light of this kind of um, really heavy overlay, but not seem to appear there. Um, the, we pulled these artifacts from the Museum Anderström, the Moss Museum in Antwerp, Belgium, and then also a small city museum in Hasselt. And then from there, uh, worked with the curators to choose what they considered the iconic forms from those eras of their collection. And then worked with a 3D scanner to go into it and, um, and create scans of the objects. And then from there, uh, essentially forced together pairs of these objects to try to, in 3D space, force them to try to become like the other. So on the left-hand side is a small Congolese object. On the right-hand side is an Art Nouveau Belgian object. And we ran, we ran an algorithm through Cinema 4D to force them to become like each other. And what happens, though, is this fracturing. So you get these sort of iceberg forms, which can't seem to kind of um, reconcile with each other. They're trying hard to, to do it, and they can't. And for me, this, these shapes are actually kind of becoming this interesting um, sort of manifestation of some of the ruptures that aren't apparent in the physical forms. And so you know, from that pair to then this pair, um, there's a, we literally, the algorithm we use, we can't control how it resolves. And so in the end, we're stuck with, with the way the forms shape out. And the next step is to actually print them in porcelain. So that's, you know, 3D printing technology is now starting to catch up where printing in porcelain is possible, but the files that I'm rendering are so difficult that I've consulted with a bunch of different 3D um, experts 
uh, mostly in Europe, some here in the US, and they've tried running my files for me and it's crashing the systems, which I think is also a really interesting idea. You know, like, so I spent the last, I spent three months in Belgium working on this project and it essentially, it's, so far it's failed. This is a one print that we were able to produce and working with, the, working with the sponsors of my project, they're really upset about it and I keep telling them that, no, I think this is part of the process you know, this, this kind of failure of it, like seances don't work all the time. You know, when you're trying to call up a ghost, there it's, it's very difficult, and there's an impossibility about it, and maybe it's not gonna work, maybe it will. And so for me, part of this, this struggle has been to, um, to keep moving forward with it, and it might be a red herring, but we're, we're, we're hoping to print out these objects. And I think I'm going to end with some of the video that we've produced of it. So these are these are animations, and unfortunately, they're not. They don't run smoothly because of the the choppiness of the system. But I think you get a, you get a sense of it. So these are two forms, uh, in real or in in time, attempting to become like the other. And there's this kind of fascinating. Uh, the growth and then the the cracking and the fracturing that happens, and so the the animations exist. They they're doing they're 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 doing what they should do in virtual space. Now the trick is to try to get it to do it in in real in um, in the physical world because, you know, I think also manifesting the the legacy of colonialism and empire is it should be a hard thing, it shouldn't be easy, and it it's probably not something that happens all the time. But anyway, I'm, I'm going to end that there. So I'll just scroll through the videos, but thank you. <laughs>